Check out the brand new shirts, including trusty blue and the Sting Money design, over at ProWrestlingTees.com slash 616 Entertainment. This video is also brought to you in part by the Patreon producers, without whom content like this would not be possible. The year is 1995. The prime years of video arcades have come and gone, but it's not over just yet. There's still a little bit of life in these old bones. And you're a 90s kid. You're too young to realize you missed the glory days anyway, so what's the difference? The carpet, which is decorated with shooting stars and distant planets, adds an otherworldly feel to this otherwise pedestrian Saturday night. You're not here for a friend's birthday party, no. This is an adventure. The sounds of high scores being broken and quarters dropping into machines permeates the thick, heavy air. Air that very well may be two parts pepperoni pizza scent and only one part breathable oxygen. But that's not what's important. What's truly important is locating the game you want to play. Area 51 is an easy go-to. Mortal Kombat 1, 2, and 3 are all jammed next to each other. There's always Terminator 2. It's hard to choose. But then, like an audible parting of the clouds, it calls to you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Howard Finkel. And welcome to WrestleMania. That familiar voice, those familiar sounds. You turn the corner and there it is. WWF WrestleMania, the arcade game. Business just picked up. What's up, Dan Dans? Welcome to Season 2 of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. We're opening up hot with a highly requested title for 1995. WWF WrestleMania, the arcade game, is far from a traditional grappler, but it does have a hell of a lot of charm. As the name indicates, yeah, this title received a full arcade release. There are definitely more home console WWF or WWE games than there are arcade cabinets across the decades. So what made this one so special? Well, it's not a widely known fact, but WrestleMania the arcade game started as a Sega Genesis exclusive. It wasn't until the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be, Bret Hart, joined the team at Midway as lead director that things took a turn. Brett actually took a sabbatical from in-ring competition in 1994 to step into this role, which, in my mind, was for the better, as his fresh approach to video game development arguably revolutionized wrestling games as we know them today. I'm kidding, obviously. These are clips from a behind-the-scenes featurette that chronicles the making of WrestleMania the arcade game, and I just felt like it was the perfect opportunity to make that joke. Don't tell Brett. These clips of wrestlers in a studio show exactly how their likenesses were captured for the game. There's a reason that really looks like Shawn Michaels on the screen. It's because it's really Shawn Michaels. This digitized graphical style was popularized in 1992 by Mortal Kombat, another game created by Chicago-based developer Midway. Each and every movement you see Yokozuna make in-game was captured here in this studio. The series of real-life photographs are dropped directly onto a computer-generated background, and that, Dan Dan's, is what digitized graphics are all about. As you may have already inferred from the clips on the screen, this is no ordinary wrestling game. We're not locking up right when the bell rings, there are no rest holds here. This is out of control. Look at this shit! It's utter pandemonium! In real life, The Undertaker's finishing move is the Tombstone Piledriver. Everybody knows that. In the game, he's just gonna smash a tombstone over your head! Hit Bret Hart with a high-impact strike and he's gonna bleed hearts all over the place. Bam Bam Bigelow's entire body is engulfed in flames as he flies through the sky, crushing whoever is unlucky enough to be his opponent on that night. The Mortal Kombat comparisons really overflow once the controller, or joystick, is in your hands and you can feel how the moves are pulled off. To throw ice as Sub-Zero, we all know it's down forward low punch. To execute a razor's edge as Scott Hall, it's forward forward high kick. Go ahead, hold block and press up up to hit Scorpion's fatality. In WrestleMania, you can press up down down punch as The Undertaker and he'll raise a coffin from the depths and send his opponent straight to hell. 
Fun fact, you can only perform this fatality move on the arcade and Sega Genesis versions of the game. Why? I don't know. You might recall me giving WWF Warzone a hard time over the fact that the moves were all tied to complicated button combinations. How the fuck am I supposed to remember that? Five buttons for one move? And every finisher has a different combination? And you might call me a hypocrite in that I'm putting over WrestleMania the arcade game for something very similar, but when you break it down, there's a distinct difference. Warzone was trying its hardest to be a wrestling game. And with that in mind, the combos don't feel right. WrestleMania? We're not even going to attempt to claim that they were trying to make a product that resembled traditional wrestling. This is chaos. And when you're mimicking Mortal Kombat's entire presentation, from graphical style to movesets, all the way down to making each and every match a 2 out of 3 falls in order to copy the rounds of a fighting game, it feels much more at home here. Plus. Every wrestler's special move combos are listed in the manual. This is a lifesaver. There are two main gameplay modes, and in order to dive into one of them, you've got to ask yourself, do you want to capture the Intercontinental title? Or do you have your eyes set on the greatest prize in the industry, the World Wrestling Federation Championship? Both modes start out the same way, showing your character sprinting down a stylized entrance ramp before coming face to face with an opponent. Beating down the opposition leaves them seeing stars, and we're on to the next. Try and tell me this is not a WWF variation of Mortal Kombat's arcade ladder. The energy of each and every competition is heightened by crystal clear commentary from the team of Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler. Tonight's matchup, Razor Ramon versus Lex Luger and <laughs> The challenge increases as the mode progresses, throwing two-on-one and even three-on-one matches in our way. The final match pits you against the game's entire roster in a gauntlet. I hope you packed a lunch for this one. When all of our opponents are left in a heap and the championship is ours, the pyro goes off, the crowd erupts, and we're served up some of the most insane endings in fighting or wrestling game history. Take this one, for instance. Here's the story we get when completing the game with the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. Shawn strutted around the ring arrogantly for several minutes, flexing and chewing his gum with an obnoxious smirk on his face. He had always bragged that he was the greatest thing to grace the World Wrestling Federation, and now he has finally proven it. The ladies in the audience reached out their arms to him and screamed his name. With that, Sean thought he'd be cute by teasing them with a little hip action. The ladies, in an uncontrollable lust craze frenzy, stampeded the ring like cattle, trying to get hold of him. Sean scrambled to escape the clutches of the horde, but to no avail. They quickly cornered him and proceeded to ravage him mercilessly. When they were through, Sean was left lying motionless, sans his clothing and some hair, yet with a big old grin stamped on his face. He loved the attention, and more so, he loved the women. His craving for attention and multiple women led him to leave wrestling and become a politician, where he could get his fill of both. Good lord, dozens of women rushing the ring and fucking him over and over? That's assault, brother. And then to turn it into a Clinton joke at the end. Good god almighty. But that's nothing compared to Bam Bam Bigelow's ending. The remains of his final opponents cooled down to smoldering ashes. However, Bam Bam did not. Still fired up from the heat of battle with eyes glaring, chest heaving, and licks of flame dancing up from his hands, Bam Bam turned to the audience and delivered a vigilant stare. His eyes scanned back and forth and a sinister smile crept across his face. He raised his hands and without warning came a blast of flames which engulfed the entire stadium. The audience was charred to flakes. The stadium was reduced to pebbles, and the WWF title belonged to Bam Bam Bigelow. The undisputed champion stood among the silent ruins of the now shattered amphitheater, master of all he surveyed. Yes, you heard that correctly. After winning the world title, Bam Bam Bigelow took it upon himself to murder 20,000 people. I'm not making this up, it's right there on the screen. What the fuck, man? For as over the top as the game is presentation wise, the same can certainly not be said for its depth. Yes, I am aware that this was an arcade release, intended to have players drop in a quarter, have fun for a few minutes, and move on, 
but let's be real. This title was ported to every living system known to man at the time. Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, 32X, the Sony PlayStation, Sega Saturn, so on and so forth. It would have been nice to have just a tiny more variety on the gameplay front. And while we're at it, what's up with this roster? Sure, these are eight of the coolest guys from the 1995 WWF lineup, but where the hell is Big Daddy Cool Diesel? I understand it takes time to add people into your game, there's no one button system that skips all of the hard work, but Diesel held the WWF Championship for just about all of 1995, and he won it in 1994! Let's give Midway the benefit of the doubt and say that they started working on this game in early 94. Diesel was already a big deal in 93, and was the Intercontinental Champion in early 94. I'm gonna chalk it up to being a major oversight rather than laziness, but still, it's a huge omission. I'm not asking for some obscure character, I'm not questioning why the 1994 Hardy Boys weren't here. This is Big Daddy Cool, damn it! I can tell you that my childhood memories of this game are a total toss-up. I never owned this one, personally. This was not a game that I would throw into my Sega Genesis or, later, my PlayStation on regular occasions. My run-ins with this one were exclusively through rentals. You've got your Hollywood videos, you got your blockbusters, or, I mean, you had them. Rest in peace. There were a million video stores back then, right? I would always go with my parents to a local place called Your Video Station in Alsip, Illinois, the town where I grew up. I was always freaked out by the cover of the Ghoulies tape. What the fuck is this little guy doing in the toilet? What's he doing in there? Are those suspenders over his shoulders to hold his pants up? Or is that an Olympic gold medal for poo diving that we can't see because of some unfortunate positioning? Who is Ghoulies? Is that little man's name Ghoulies? Or is he a Ghoulie? I would think about this every time I went to your video station. Until, one day, I walked past the horror section and oh my god they had Ghoulies too! Ghoulie looked like he grew up! He was a baby on the first one, now he looks like a grown-ass Ghoulie! And who is this guy? Is he Ghoulie's friend? Is he Ghoulie's enemy? How the hell does he fit inside the tank of the toilet with a head that big? How many Ghoulies are there? What was I even talking about? Oh yeah, I would rent the Genesis version of WrestleMania the Arcade game every once in a while. It was fun for a little bit, but it never did much to really keep my attention. Jesus Christ, I like blacked out there for a second. WrestleMania the Arcade Game is a snapshot of a moment in time. It was the waning years, the twilight if you will, of video arcades. It's a testament to how popular Mortal Kombat was and how, honestly, Midway could do absolutely no wrong at the time. Basketball? They killed it. Football? Killed it. Martial Arts? Killed it. Wrestling? Come on, you get the picture. But apart from the video game realm, this was a representation of the WWF. I mean, it's turned up to 11, no doubt about it, but Vince McMahon had voodoo witch doctors putting curses on whatever the hell the Ultimate Warrior was supposed to be. A curse that eventually saw green goo ooze from the warrior's head. For some reason. With stupid shit like this taking place on the WWF's actual programming, you don't think Vince McMahon would have had Undertaker uppercutting people 50 feet into the air if he could figure out how to actually pull it off? You know he would have. With as insane and goofy as pro wrestling was here in the early to mid 90s, it's no wonder why the video game representation would be so over the top. This is what kids felt like they were watching back then. Superheroes and villains battling it out in an over the top war for supremacy. A war for supremacy that could be merchandised in arcades, bedrooms, and even on video cassette via its very own Coliseum video release, complete with tips, tricks, and cheat codes for only $29.95. And that right there, Dan Dans, is the story of WrestleMania the arcade game. It performed well in arcades, the PlayStation port even sold well enough to be given a Greatest Hits re-release. It's just, it's kind of strange that with as well as this game did and as much fun as people had with it, it was never followed up with a sequel. You would think Midway, or at least the WWF, would have- Come on, you thought I wasn't gonna talk about the sequel? I don't think so. WWF In Your House, the follow-up to WrestleMania, the arcade game, released about a year later on the PlayStation, the Sega Saturn, and PC. The arcades were left behind at this point, making In Your House exclusive to home consoles. 
In Your House was literally in your house. This FMV intro was awesome in 1996, and it's goddamn awesome now. Jerry Lawler has been swapped out of the commentary booth in favor of Mr. Perfect, making this his one and only appearance in a video game where he's wearing a headset rather than a singlet. We've lost more than half the roster of WrestleMania, but they've all been replaced, and then some, as the roster size has improved from 8 playable characters to 10. We've got names like Owen Hart, The Ultimate Warrior, Goldust, and Vadar. Yeah, that's how you pronounce it, right? Vadar? No? Well then why the fuck does it say Vadar on the box? Look, the gameplay of In Your House is practically a copy and paste from WrestleMania, that's fine. But look at these new arenas. We're in Stu Hart's dungeon, Goldust's personal weird ass museum place, a local gym, and even the Undertaker's underground lair complete with the hanging corpse of the angry video game nerd? This game is fucked up. Both In Your House and WrestleMania the arcade game are moments in time. A time when pro wrestling wasn't just ridiculous and fantastical, but proud to be ridiculous and fantastical. A time when sports games didn't have to be 100% realistic simulations. They could take the overall idea of football or basketball or even wrestling and turn it up to 11. Games like WrestleMania and In Your House walked so that games like All Stars and Battlegrounds could run. These may not be technical masterpieces like Here Comes the Pain or No Mercy, but they've got their charm. And for that reason, I'll always give these two a nod of approval. That's it! Dan Dan's This was the Season 2 premiere of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. I wanted to start off big and surprise you guys with a little bit of double header action. That's why there's no mention of In Your House in the thumbnail or in the title. I wanted it to be a surprise. And hopefully the next episode is a surprise as well when we take a look at WWE WrestleMania 19 on the GameCube. That's our first GameCube game to get a deep dive here, and I'm very, very excited about it. Until next time, I love ya, and I will see you... See, I said next time already. I can't say next time again. In 2021, there's one mainline WWE video game franchise. The 2K games drop every year like clockwork. Well, almost every year. And despite their most recent, catastrophic release, let's be honest, this franchise is pretty damn good. There are corners of the internet that would have you believe that these games are garbage, they're terrible, they're the worst wrestling games ever, but come on. They're just a different style than what we grew up with, you know? You don't have to like it, but to claim they're all trash, it's just unrealistic. What is annoying though, and I'll give you this, is the lack of variety. And I'm not talking about, you know, we used to have WCW, WWF, and ECW games all on the shelves at the same time. I'm talking about the early to mid 2000s, where there were three distinct WWE video game franchises exclusive to three different consoles. It was a hell of a time. Hey Dan Dans, welcome to another installment of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. Last time out we covered 1995's WWF WrestleMania, the arcade game. But I swerved you a little bit, and I snuck in some coverage of its sequel, WWF In Your House, as well. Today's episode is advertised as WWE WrestleMania 19 on the GameCube, but... Warning. Swerve alert. Swerve alert. You're about to be swerved. I'm swerving you sons of bitch again. How the hell would we talk about WrestleMania 19 and not talk about its predecessor, WWF WrestleMania X8? I hope you're strapped in, because it's time for another doubleheader, Dan Dans. WWE WrestleMania X8, or WrestleMania 18, was the first World Wrestling Entertainment offering to hit Nintendo's fancy new tiny disc console, the GameCube, in June of 2002. What the hell was the whole X7 and X8 thing about? I don't know! For years, the rulers of the wrestling space on the Nintendo side of things were the Aki Corporation. You know these guys. They brought us everything from WCW NWO Revenge to WWF No Mercy. To say they've got a bit of a legacy behind them would be an understatement. But as beloved as Aki were, things didn't really work out for them in the mainstream wrestling scene beyond the November 2000 release of No Mercy. It was after the abysmal launch of WCW Backstage Assault that EA said, you know what, 
We need the best of the best to write this ship. EA reached an agreement to publish WCW Mayhem 2, which would be developed by Aki. This could have been amazing. We could be talking about this game in the same light that we talk about the other Aki classics, but it was not to be. WCW getting scooped up and shelved by the WWF in March of 2001 caused Aki to call an audible, and what was initially WCW Mayhem 2 would eventually see the light of day as Def Jam Vendetta. You can learn all about this in the Def Jam Vendetta episode from Season 1 of this show. The link is in the description. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because it was a big deal that there was a new WWF game coming to a Nintendo console and Aki weren't behind the wheel. For WrestleMania X8, the keys would be given to Ukes, the very same developer behind the SmackDown series on the PlayStation. And don't get confused, I see people make this mistake all the time. THQ were a publisher, Ukes were a developer. Ukes made the game, THQ put it out. Got it? And while that sounds pretty cool, I mean, the SmackDown games are awesome, what the hell would be the point of doing another series exclusive to a different console just for it to feel exactly the same? Here's where some big decisions were made. THQ didn't want a SmackDown clone. WrestleMania X8 was intended to feel like its own unique beast. And while there was some overlap between team members on SmackDown and WrestleMania, it was not the exact same lineup by any means. As a matter of fact, THQ actually poached several Aki Corporation employees to put directly on the WrestleMania development team in order to ensure it carried its own identity. They went out of their way to make this GameCube debut feel special, and I'll be damned if they didn't accomplish just that. What's interesting about WrestleMania X8 is that the box art says WWE, but all across the inside of the actual game, we've got WWF logos galore. That's because this game was released just a few short months after the World Wildlife Fund took down the World Wrestling Federation in court, and the WWE name change took hold. It was too late to go into the game and change everything, so they just changed the box art. Here's the original and the updated version side by side. The PAL release updated the cover art once again, replacing the recently disenfranchised Stone Cold Steve Austin with The Rock. What a journey simply surrounding the cover art, right? Gameplay-wise, WrestleMania X8 found a sweet spot between being its own game and taking inspiration from the SmackDown titles, which is not a bad thing. The grappling mechanics are admittedly pretty limited, with only 5 front and rear grappling moves per character. Honestly, No Mercy had 20 front grapples per character, and that came out several years prior on a previous generation, so this could have been a little deeper for sure. The roster was awesome, as this was the first WWE release to feature the massive influx of former WCW and ECW talent. We've got debuts here the likes of Booker T, Rob Van Dam, The Hurricane, and more. But how about the fucking NWO? This was the first time Scott Hall had appeared in a WWE game since 1995, the first for Kevin Nash since 1994, and the first for Hulk Hogan since 1993. The band was back together in a big way, and it was awesome to be able to play as the original members of what is arguably the greatest faction in the history of pro wrestling once again. Outside of a super deep exhibition mode complete with gimmick matches like TLC, Steel Cage, and more, there are also several different game modes open to the player right from the start. Path of a Champion allows you to basically run through an arcade ladder, Mortal Kombat style, until you win whichever title you are going after. Battle of the Belts, though, is where things get a little more interesting. If you're a weirdo belt mark like I am, maybe you know what I'm going to talk about here. Look at some of these belts. We've got The Rock's custom Brahma Bowl title, which never even made it to TV. We've got Austin's short-lived Smoking Skull belt, but what's this? That's a knockoff of the WCW World Title. That's the ECW TV Championship. That's the old IWGP belt. That's the AWA World Championship. This was so cool to me as a belt mark. There are 51 of these things on this list, man. And the deeper you go, the deeper the references go. Super cool. But as you might imagine, there are a few less than stellar and downright strange quirks to this game. Some of the wrestlers' bodies are comically out of scale. This isn't the super exaggerated style of Legends of Wrestling. I cannot explain why Rob Van Dam looks the way he does. There's absolutely no animation for breaking the announce table. It's up one second, and the next, it's not. The normal wooden tables are fucking enormous. These things look like they were borrowed from the Last Supper. And what the fuck is with how the tables break in the corner? 
In real life, you set the thing up and you break through it. It crumbles. In WrestleMania X8, breaking a table in the corner sends the thing careening into the sky like it was spring-loaded. Smash. Smash! Hilarious. Quirks aside, when it came down to it, WrestleMania X8 did the damn thing. It reviewed fairly well, it sold fairly well, and it proved to be a great starting point for WWE and THQ's new venture on the Nintendo GameCube. The foundation had been set for this new franchise, and now it was time for the developers to iterate on their original ideas, improve existing framework, and do the best they could to deliver a top-tier sequel. This is where the advertised portion of this episode begins, Dan Dans. It's time to talk about WWE WrestleMania 19. Man, 2003 was a hell of a time, wasn't it? World Wrestling Entertainment had officially shed the skin of the Attitude Era, ushering in the new generation of stars in a time period that has since been tagged as the Ruthless Aggression Era. Stone Cold Steve Austin had just recently retired from in-ring competition. The Rock's appearances are sporadic at best, as Hollywood is calling his name more and more frequently. Filling those shoes would be no small task, but it had to be done. Fresh blood like Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Randy Orton, Batista, and more exploded onto the scene. Faces from another land like Goldberg and Scott Steiner made their mark in the WWE world title picture. Kane lost his mask. Jeff Hardy was released from the company while Matt Hardy thrived as a single star. To call it a period of flux would be an understatement. It was just before fall in 2003 that WWE WrestleMania 19, still exclusive to the Nintendo GameCube, would hit store shelves. We know because we've covered it that WrestleMania X8 was pretty cool, but how would the sequel fare? Well, the tiny little GameCube disc is emblazoned with the big gold belt, and I gotta believe that's a good sign. Spoilers, it is indeed a good sign. WrestleMania 19 looks way way better than 18 did, and that's saying something, as 18 had a unique style of its own. But side by side, there's no debate. The wrestler's bodies look so much more detailed, from musculature to skin tone, even shape. To be honest, I knew this game was going to look great before it even shipped. Those first screenshots that came out, I think we were all like, holy shit, right? Across the board, graphically, this game was aces. I mean, they do have Stacy Keebler looking kind of fucked up in the shop zone menu. She moves like a creature from a horror movie, and it's a little unsettling. Stacy Keebler is one of the hottest wrestling babes of all time, man. This was a botch job. But aside from Stacy, can we just take a second to appreciate some of the cool little tidbits from this game? How about the justice that was done in the design of the Hell in a Cell cage? This may be the closest to perfect cell design we've ever gotten. The scale of it is dead on. The buckling of the roof's panels before the crash, the hanging chain link after the ceiling gives way, it's fantastic. Not to mention, you can climb the walls of the cell on the inside, which is cool. And you can get weapons from under the ring during a cell match, something that WrestleMania's sister series, SmackDown, did not allow. And if we're putting over match types at the moment, let me show some love to the Royal Rumble. I promise I won't keep bringing up SmackDown, but from the very first release, all the way up to 2003's Here Comes the Pain, their Royal Rumble match was barely, and I mean barely, changed at all. WrestleMania 19 shows up and says, hey, you're not just gonna Irish whip every single guy right over the top as soon as they get in the ring. You gotta toss them over and then beat the ever-living shit out of them and drain their meter before they actually get eliminated. This made Rumble matches longer, more realistic, and overall, more fun. A great improvement. This is the part where when I'm covering practically any other wrestling game that released after 1999, we'd be talking about the season mode. Well, WrestleMania 19 doesn't have a season mode. In its place is revenge mode. What the hell is revenge mode? Well, I'm gonna tell you. Vince McMahon has had enough of your shit. He's had you beaten down, dragged around, and now you're fired. Security guards literally throw you out the back exit to the building, right at the feet of the awaiting Stephanie McMahon. Hey, why the fuck was Stephanie all dressed up like that to stand in the parking lot of a sports arena at 10 o'clock at night? Well, because she's got big plans. Big plans that are gonna shape the outline of revenge mode. So did Stephanie know the fucking play was getting fired that night and that's why she was standing out there? 
Or has she been standing in the parking lot of every fucking arena for the past however knows long, waiting for somebody to get fired so she could tell her plan to them? Well, the plot of Revenge Mode is, I mean, Steph McMahon, listen, will you shut the fuck up and let us design the game? Stephanie's got a plan. She wants to take down her dad by ruining WrestleMania. And she's using us to do her bidding. What kind of bidding, you ask? The first mission, yes, mission, there are no wrestling matches, just missions, has us traveling to the work site where the WrestleMania arena is being built. And what are we doing here? Stealing blueprints? Nope. Our goal is to literally kill all of the construction workers who have been employed to get the arena up in time for the show. You can call me dramatic, you can argue with me all you want. We are killing these poor fuckers by throwing them off this ledge. They're not falling six feet and twisting their ankle. We're so goddamn high in the air that we don't even see the impact of their bodies exploding on the asphalt below. Those guys are dead. And for what? What is all this violence for? These guys aren't even WWE employees. Vince McMahon's not gonna feel this in his pocketbook. These are union guys with families at home. They're just doing their job trying to build this arena that's only gonna host one show. Because that's how WWE handles WrestleMania, right? They never rent out existing buildings. They always pay $650 million a year to have their own version of AT&T Stadium built that they use one time and then it's demolished. That's what they always do, right? But whatever. So we killed a bunch of innocent people and got away with it. Now what? Oh, now we're going to a shopping mall to kill some unrelated security guards. Hey man, the wind condition says to make them bleed and knock them out. But I've been making sure all of these dudes are drowned in the mall fountain. Maybe I'm the problem. This is fucking ridiculous. Look at this. Stone Cold Steve Austin in full underwear ass ring gear, handing out cans of whoop ass on mall cops. This looks like a scene from Tim and Eric's billion dollar movie. But there's more to revenge mode than just mass murder in public places. Outside of killing construction workers and mall security, we're also tasked with vandalism in the shape of destroying cars. Killing dock workers by throwing them off a platform in the middle of the ocean. Hmm. No, that's, that's just more murder. Don't get me started on the platforming involved here. Yes, the platforming. Climbing scaffolding, swinging across, hanging, rotating chains in a parking garage that apparently has an expressway passing through it? I don't know. This whole mode is fucked up beyond belief. In my time with it, I experienced several visual and auditory glitches. You will 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 be compensated with cash for each objective you complete. And I'm not kidding. After hitting the button to wrap up the recording of this gameplay, my GameCube stopped working. I needed to capture some more footage from WrestleMania 18 and my console 100% told me to go fuck myself. That's revenge mode, man. I'm not gonna lie to you and say that revenge mode had no upside though. I don't know about you guys, but my friends and I, we loved to have fatal four-way matches on the harbor stage. Climbing that big ass chain all the way up to the top, smashing through the floor and falling into the ocean. That shit was fun. It may have been nonsensical and ridiculous, but this is wrestling. It's all nonsensical and ridiculous. What isn't nonsensical and ridiculous is the return of the strong grapple. There's absolutely nothing wrong with taking that Aki formula and bringing it into other wrestling games. The gameplay is way, way slower than WrestleMania 18 though, I must say. Slower than the SmackDown games as well. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't really mind the more methodical pace. This is the team trying to find that balance between arcade and realism, you know? What I do have issues with, though, is the fact that fairly often, you're gonna reach out and grapple at no one simply because you're not perfectly lined up with your opponent. That's annoying. As is the mechanic that allows any single movement to interrupt a grapple move. If you're standing near someone doing a suplex, you're taking a bump, even though you had nothing to do with the move. You're just in the way. Can we not do that? It's beyond annoying. And none, I mean none, of the GameCube WWE games fix this. Am I alone in hating this? Let me know in the comments. I want to talk about some of the weird shit in this game that sticks out in my mind like a sore thumb. I can and have gone years without playing this game, and these memories never left me. First of all, the referee, which, side note, that might look like Earl Hebner, but it's not. 
because if WWE admitted it was, they'd have to pay him. And WWE does not like to treat their employees that well. Just ask 30-year ref Mike Chioda, who WWE fired in the middle of a pandemic as a cost-cutting measure. Like, you're tied down at WWE. Couldn't get, you couldn't get royalties off of video games because they wouldn't let us in the video games. Yeah. They, you know, they let me in for a little while. And then once I was talking about, okay, where's my royalties? <laughs> it took me right out of the game. This referee will follow you to the ends of the earth. Come hell or high water, that pinfall is getting counted. He'll even scale the fucking hell in a cell cage. He'll bump through the ceiling with you. And guess what he does then? He counts the three like a fucking professional. Bless you, nameless, royalty-free referee. Attention to detail is something that I feel should always be commended. And let me tell you, I was pleasantly surprised when I put together a Dudley Boys vs. Booker T and Goldust tag match only to see Booker and Goldust come out together in all their odd couple glory. Amazing. And in a world of knockoff music for the NWO, Randy Orton, which this one is super odd, seeing as though Motorhead made the Evolution song specifically for WWE, Booker T and others, it's crazy that they licensed Voodoo Child from Jimi Hendrix for Hulk Hogan. What the hell is that about? You can pay the Hendrix estate but not dip into your own catalog for the Evolution song? Someone do some digging on this for me. I need answers. You know what else I need? I need to tell you about the King of the Ring mode. Holy hell. You can go through and set the bracket perfectly how you like it if you want to, but my god is it entertaining to sit back and just roll with the AI picks. Round one, we've got Goldberg versus Dawn Marie. You better believe Dawn Marie's going over clean. What are you, nuts? Next up, The Rock versus Victoria. And we've got a new people's champ. Get a group of friends around and place bets on one of these things. It's incredible. What really chaps my ass though is that King of the Ring mode is how you determine champions. You start by choosing the title that's gonna be on the line. But when it's over, there's no belt! The champ doesn't wear it to the ring, the winner doesn't celebrate with it. Ugh, you know this is a pet peeve of mine. As are disappearing tables. WrestleMania X8's announced tables didn't disappear after you broke them. And no answer you can possibly give me as to why they vanish in 19 will suffice. I hate this. But let's counteract that hate with a little bit of love. This roster is a fucking chef's kiss. I adore the 2003 WWE lineup, man. So many guys and girls that I have great memories with are here. I do wonder though, why is Goldberg stuck all the way down there at the very bottom? Look at the top row, it's all main eventers. So why isn't Goldberg up there? I've tried to dissect this layout and make sense of it and there are some connections. For instance, why are Austin and Rock at the beginning? Why isn't this in alphabetical order? Well. I don't have an answer for why it's not in alphabetical order, but Rock and Austin did face each other at WrestleMania 19. Jericho and Shawn Michaels also went one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania 19, so we may have a pattern here. Angle and Lesnar, another one. But Triple H, hmm. He faced Booker T, and they're not side-by-side. -side. Hogan's all by himself as well, when he should be next to Vince McMahon. RVD and Kane are a tag team, so that makes sense. As were the Dudleys. Okay, we're back. Hurricane and Goldust throw it off though. I mean, Edge and Ray were teammates, Big Show's alone, Chris Benoit killed his family. Ah, I don't know, I'm not sure. I thought maybe we could decipher this thing, but there just seems to be no real rhyme or reason. WrestleMania 19 is a hell of a game. Visually, it's big time. In the gameplay department, it's no slouch. You're bound to stay entertained by the sheer variety of gimmick matches and revenge mode, man. What a strange trip into the mind of someone, I don't know. But with all the positives I've pointed out in this retrospective, as well as the strange little quirks, how did WrestleMania do with critics? How well did it perform sales-wise? The event that the game takes its name from is regarded as one of the greatest WrestleManias of all time, so this adaptation better be good, right? Well, luckily for Ukes and THQ, it was good. The review scores were favorable across the board. It was even nominated for Best Fighting Game at the 2003 Spike Video Game Awards. An award that was won by SmackDown Here Comes the Pain, so either way, Ukes and THQ were living large. 
And while WrestleMania 19's success at retail continued to pave the way for future WWE branded titles exclusive to Nintendo's GameCube, subsequent releases would stray from the WrestleMania name in favor of Day of Reckoning. But that's another story for another time. You know those certain friends you have growing up where you think, man, 20 years from now, we're still going to be super close. I had a friend like that. I was a PlayStation guy, he was a Nintendo guy. We were both huge wrestling fans back in the day, and he happened to have a GameCube. WrestleMania 19 is the last game that my friend Bobby Morrissey and I bonded over. Not everything lasts. In 2004, I moved away from the neighborhood I grew up in, and we lost touch. I mean, we lost touch shockingly fast. It was pretty disappointing. But even though we didn't remain super close and we haven't spoken in years, that doesn't mean that those memories I have were for nothing. I'll always think of WrestleMania 19, I'll think of my buddy Bobby Morrissey, and I'm going to be transported back in time, sitting on his floor during a sleepover with a GameCube controller in my hands. And that is awesome. Dan Dans, this was my Triangle X Squared Circle Retrospective on WWE WrestleMania 19. And WWF WrestleMania 18 as well, because I kind of snuck that shit in there. Next time out, we're doing it big. We're doing it extreme. We're going in-depth on both ECW video games. That's Hardcore Revolution and Anarchy Rules. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but this season is fucking big time. Until then, I love you, Dan Dance. Thank you for watching. Extreme Championship Wrestling. A pioneer in the world of pro wrestling, not only for the blood and gut style that is predominantly remembered by, but for the expansion and evolution of the entire genre as a whole. Many of the high-flying moves, death-defying stunts, and bloodbath brawls we enjoy even now in 2021 grew from the seeds planted decades ago in ECW. You're probably aware that our favorite extreme wrestling promotion began its life in 1992 as Eastern Championship Wrestling, a subsidiary of the National Wrestling Alliance, or NWA, so I won't start this off with a 20 minute history lesson. Long story short, in 1994, everything changed. The NWA's Eastern Championship Wrestling was no more, and in its place, Extreme Championship Wrestling was born. This is where the expansion and evolution of the genre I mentioned earlier comes into play. Sure, the tables and barbed wire were awesome. There's a reason we all remember it to this very day, but what's often overlooked is just how many major, major players plied their trade under Paul Heyman's banner before US wrestling fans saw them anywhere else. I was a WCW kid growing up, and you bet your ass I was a Chris Jericho fan, a Rey Mysterio fan, a Raven fan, an Eddie Guerrero fan. Who wasn't? These guys were looked at as WCW stalwarts, and while that was indeed true, they all passed through ECW first. So with these future megastars under their umbrella, the insanely dangerous matches and cult-like fanbase, how is it that, unlike their WCW and WWF opposition, ECW didn't birth a single video game that stands the test of time? That's exactly what we're gonna dive into today. Hey Dan Dans, my name is Ian and I want to say welcome to another installment of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. You know, you guys have asked me for over a year now, maybe two years, I don't know, I lost track of time. You guys have wanted me to cover the video games of Extreme Championship Wrestling, but that's a big deal. There's only two of them, so if I'm going to do it, I wanted to do it right. So right here on this episode, we're diving straight into the history of ECW video games. Here's the thing with ECW. It's prime, it's absolute peak, it's golden era, and I think most fans and followers of the brand would agree with this, took place during the mid to late 90s. Look, from 1995 to 1999, ECW was on fire. We witnessed the rises of Rob Van Dam, Sabu, Tommy Dreamer, The Sandman, Taz, Just Incredible, Jerry Lynn, Rhino, Tajiri, and more. 
Fans of the promotion were treated to home video releases, pay-per-view events, a television series on TNN, even a brand new line of action figures featuring all of your favorite stars. ECW was awesome, man. It was different from anything else that was going on in wrestling across the entire country, and that made it special. So with all this coverage, all this merchandise, a video game couldn't be far off, right? Actually, yeah, you are right. In February of 2000, the first ever ECW video game would hit store shelves. The subtitle of Hardcore Revolution embodied the fuck you, it's time for a change attitude Extreme Championship Wrestling had built up since the day it was created. The developer behind Hardcore Revolution was Sculptured Software. What the hell did Sculptured Software ever do? Well. They were the team behind the Super Star Wars games, for one. Add in work on Mortal Kombat, The Punisher, The Simpsons, Doom, and nearly 10 unique games for the WWF, and you'll see that this team had indeed been around the block. And yeah, I said what I said. Sculptured Software were responsible for almost 10 WWF video games. From the 16-bit brawlers of Royal Rumble and Raw, to the arcade fighters of WrestleMania and In Your House, even into the 3D realm with Warzone and Attitude. You can watch my retrospective of WWF Warzone by clicking the link in the description. But the wrestling video game landscape changed in a big way in 1999. WCW had been paired up with Aki for years, bringing us classics like WCW vs. The World and even Revenge. The WWF had been aligned with Sculptured Software, delivering the aforementioned titles across practically every console known to man. And and then, they weren't. The WWF wound up on a long-term deal with Aki, stealing WCW's tag team partner. In response, WCW signed on with EA. Sculptured Software were, well, they were left out to dry. They were the odd man out, a smaller, more hardcore, if you will, game developer that seemed to be passed over in favor of multi-million dollar corporations, stranded on the island of misfit toys, as it were. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Sculptured Software and ECW were seemingly a match made in hardcore heaven. If there was anyone who would understand that odd man out, extreme, balls to the wall ECW style, it had to be Sculptured Software, right? You'd be out of your mind to not expect them to take everything they had, every programmer, every animator, every resource in that company, and pour it into the effort to come back with a bang and debut Extreme Championship Wrestling on the video game front in a way that would put the entire wrestling game landscape on notice. And they did not do that at all, clearly. I'm gonna show you just how awesome I can be. This is raw gameplay of ECW Hardcore Revolution for the PlayStation. If you're asking your screen, are you sure that's not footage from WWF Warzone? Or like, a mod of WWF Attitude or something? Yes, I am quite sure. Although you're not far off, ECW Hardcore Revolution hit the Sony PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and Sega Dreamcast all on the same day. And everyone's reaction was exactly the same. I've played this already. What Sculptured Software had done with Hardcore Revolution was unthinkable, right? And I don't mean that in the sense that they recycled a previously used game engine as that's exactly what the Aki Corporation did when they severed their contract with WCW and started developing video games for the WWF. They don't catch any flack for that. They're applauded for it. They're revered as one of the greatest of all time. But this was different. It was different in a big way. I may take a little bit of heat for this, but it's true. And you gotta let me finish what I'm saying before you get all upset about it. When it came to comparing World Championship Wrestling to the World Wrestling Federation in the late 90s and into 2000, they were largely the same in many regards. Do you like cool heel factions? Take your pick. You've got the NWO if you're a WCW fan, or you've got DX if you're into the WWF. Maybe you're more into brooding, darker, mysterious characters who always keep you guessing. Might I introduce you to Sting? Or perhaps The Undertaker. Nah, that's not you. You're more into bald, black trunks wearing world champions. No? Maybe iconic heel authority figures. Do you see what I'm getting at here? The two major players were largely similar. But ECW, Dan Dance, 
ECW was on its own. And you might be able to point to one of the categories I just listed off and fit an ECW character into that slot, but it's a square peg in a round hole. ECW wasn't built on or defined by a specific character archetype. ECW was defined by its rabid, and I mean rabid, audience. It was defined by its sheer unpredictability. It was defined, and I mean this in as positive a way I can, but its markedly lower budget appearance. It was smaller buildings with hotter crowds and crazier action, convalescing into a product that was impossible to mistake as anything but EC fucking W. So when kids like me, who couldn't wait to see what an ECW video game would look and feel like, finally got our hands on it, you can imagine it was pretty disappointing to find out this was just WWF Attitude with a bunch of ECW stickers on it. The gameplay is 100% copied and pasted over. We're still entering complicated button combos to pull off every move, from a hip toss to a finisher. The entrances, the arena layouts, the steel cage, it's all the same. What the hell is here that makes this feel like ECW? The roster? I mean, not really. Sure, we have standouts like Raven, Tommy Dreamer, and RVD, but no, the wrestlers don't make this feel like ECW, and that's because they all still walk, talk, and even stand like the WWF guys from Attitude. How about the crowd, though? Are they the raucous, rambunctious, bloodthirsty group of savages you'd expect to find in the ECW arena? <laughs> No. The only, and I mean only saving grace here, is Joey Styles on commentary. And that's commentary he does solo, by the way, which is not something I can ever recall happening in another wrestling game. His commentary isn't good, but it's here. And that's not a knock on Joey's actual work, it's just, in the game it's mostly a bunch of no-context reactions, rather than his in-depth and fast-paced work we were used to in real life. <laughs> oh. Original gangster gets away with the choke. Pin pusher. Ugh. Oh. Vertical suplex. That kept player two down. Oh. Hey! I like Joey Styles a lot. Don't get it twisted. I feel like I might have gotten a little bit of doubt when I said that there wasn't anything here to actually make this feel like ECW. What about the table crashing, ladder falling, balcony diving insanity that came along with the real life product? Nope, there are no tables in Hardcore Revolution, which is incredible seeing as though WWF Warzone, the first game to use this engine, featured breakable tables, and that was developed in 1997. There's also no ladders to fly off and no balconies to dive from, so no, none of it. I told you. Let's talk about match types though. I know you remember the classic last man standing matches from ECW history, right? No? Oh yeah, they didn't have any. The steel cage we've got here is the same, completely fabricated, nonsensical, no ropes or ring post bullshit from Warzone. Listen, I'll give Hardcore Revolution this. It was the first game I'd ever played that featured barbed wire ropes. That was a cool visual, I can't pretend it's not. But when you realize there's only one animation for the guys hitting the barbed wire and other than that it's the same as every other match, the luster wears off pretty quickly. And it's worth noting that Hardcore Revolution is rated M for Mature, making this the first wrestling game to ever get that rating from the ESRB. Why is it rated M? I have absolutely no idea. The vulgar language is censored. Time for a 187 on your fing ass! And the blood content is damn near the same it was in its WWF predecessors. Uncharted Drake's Fortune is rated T, for Christ's sake. And I'm not joking when I say you kill over a thousand people across that story mode with a multitude of firearms and explosives. So why is ECW rated M? Well, because it's extreme. AKA, it looks better on the box for marketing purposes. You know what Paul Heyman always said, hide the negatives, accentuate the positives. When the ability to book your own matches gets boring way faster than any $50 game should, you start to look outside of exhibition mode at what else the game has to offer. Create a wrestler is practically the same it was in WWF Attitude, so next. Career mode has you taking your wrestler through the ranks, show by show, until- Yeah, it's the same as WWF Attitude. 
It is worth noting, though, that winning championships and completing specific tasks unlocks a multitude of hidden characters. We've got the all-time babe Beulah McGillicuddy, Taz, who had left for the WWF before the game released, and even Louis Spicoli, an ECW alum who had died a full two years before the launch of Hardcore Revolution. It's said that his inclusion in the game was a personal favor to Tommy Dreamer, who references his fallen friend in his pre-match promos. ECW Hardcore Revolution was a letdown of epic proportions. An extreme letdown, if you will. It reviewed very poorly across the board, but somehow, probably on name value alone, it managed to sell several hundred thousand copies. And I'm not gonna lie to you, when I was younger, I played Hardcore Revolution quite a bit. Did I own it? Hell no, I didn't own it. But, I think I rented this game probably like 10 times. I can't explain it. I knew it wasn't a true ECW experience, but I wanted it to be so bad that I just kept coming back to it. Well, there's that and... My friends and I found it very funny when Roadkill would say, CHICKENS! I don't know why. I can't explain it. We were young and dumb, what do you want? After what was undoubtedly a less than stellar first effort, what would be next for Extreme Championship Wrestling on the video game front? Would Sculptured Software scrap the nearly five-year-old skeleton of WWF Warzone and really give ECW the fresh, unique treatment it deserved? Well, in just six months' time, we'd get our answer. And no, I did not misspeak. ECW Anarchy Rules released six months after Hardcore Revolution. You're probably thinking, Wait a minute. There's no way you could be able to do anything good in six months. No way. Almost. Nope. Sorry. I am not kidding when I tell you this. It's literally WWF Attitude again. AGAIN! Sure, they added some new moves here and there and a couple new match types. Which we'll get to, hold your horses. But it's the same fucking game again. How Acclaim, or Sculptured Software, whatever the hell they were calling themselves at this point, thought that was acceptable to do AGAIN, I have no idea. Here's what I'm thinking. ECW's in the fucking shit. They're on life support. We got these guys locked down for two games. We pop them out before they kick the bucket. Well, how long do you think it's going to be before they're out of business? I'm thinking anywhere between, uh, I don't know, five minutes and uh, six months. So what do we do? Have you been paying attention to fucking anything these past four years? We do what we always do. You put the same fucking game out and you add, like, two new things. So what do we add? It's, it's extreme, right? Should we add something extreme? I know we really didn't do that last time. I don't give a flying red's ass what you do. You can make a match where you fucking throw a guy in the burn hot fire and he dies. I don't care. What are going to do to each other? Did that conversation actually take place? I don't know. But how the hell else would we have wound up with the Brimstone match? This doesn't have an ECW aura about it. It doesn't have any aura about it because it's not a real match! What else did they do here to up the extreme factor after completely failing on Hardcore Revolution? Oh, I got it. How about a dumpster match? You can count on your own ass how many dumpster matches there were in ECW history, because it's another complete and total miss. I'd like to face the developers that sculptured software in a dumpster match so I can throw them inside the goddamn thing, and they can find copies of their own ECW games at the bottom. But there's gotta be more here, right? Of course there is. Let me introduce you to Rage in the Cage. Is it an extreme cage match? Nope. It's the UFC octagon dropped right in the center of the ECW arena for some reason. The fuck is this I'm hearing about you idiots putting in a UFC cage or whatever? You said we could do whatever we want! <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. Why is the floor of the octagon brown? I don't know. Is it supposed to be dirt? Or is it a brown canvas? If it is dirt, why does this cage have a dirt floor? I don't know. <laughs> Come on! Listen, it's either this or the backlot match, and unless you want to run around outside the ECW arena and step on a used needle or see a rat the size of Hornswoggle running down the street on its hind legs carrying an entire boxed pizza, I recommend you stay inside the building. Maybe this big fucking cage will keep you safe. You know what's funny, though? Hardcore Revolution was rated M for Mature. 
Anarchy Rules allows you to burn an opponent alive and listen to them scream out their final breath, and it's got a T for teens rating. What changed? Anarchy Rules is inarguably more vulgar and violent than its predecessor. Much like the development of this game, it makes no sense whatsoever. Nor does their table match that they've added here. Listen, table matches are some of my favorites of all time. You win by putting a guy through a table. It's simple. Here in Anarchy Rules, it's not that simple. Because why would it be? The ring is surrounded by tables that you cannot interact with in any way. They stay put. Merely coming in contact with them at all breaks them in half. And there's no animation for it breaking. Don't get crazy. There are two frames. Unbroken and broken. How do you win? Pinfall or submission. Good lord. The things that really catch you off guard in Anarchy Rules have very little to do with the gameplay, and you might not notice them at all unless you're really paying attention. Would you believe that this is the first time Dusty Rhodes has ever been playable in a video game? I'm not kidding. And no, his role as a manager in Revenge does not count. That's why I said playable. This is also the only video game to ever feature Joel Gertner on commentary. Ah, a dastardly one! Almost tapped ah, out! That should have put him out! Dusty ah. Rhodes! Escape somehow! There are jobber characters early on in career mode, one of which is longtime Ring of Honor booker Gabe Sapolsky. So that's something. And hell, ECW wrestlers use popular songs from big name artists as their entrance music without permission, which obviously couldn't be done here in the game, but we do have New Jack's custom theme song which was recorded by New Jack himself. Normally on an episode of Triangle X Squared Circle, I'll run down a long list of positives and then I show up on camera and say, unfortunately, not everything was perfect. This has been the exact opposite. I've been pretty hard on the ECW video games, and with good reason. But fortunately, there are some positive aspects that I'd like to shine a light on. First and foremost, I think it's really cool that we can create our own rings and arenas. Is this a feature that's been around since WWF Attitude? I mean, yeah, it is, but they didn't cut it out. And when you really think about it, we didn't have this type of control over creating our own rings and changing the colors of the ropes and turnbuckle pads again until the release of WWE 12, which was more than a decade after Anarchy Rules' release. And speaking of features the 2K games touted as being new and innovative, Anarchy Rules has a create a match feature. Do you want tables surrounding the ring, but you can only win by landing your finisher? You can make that happen. Do you want to book a barbed wire two out of three falls match? Go for it. Sure, the options are limited, but they're here. Ugh, I mean, both of the positives I've chosen to highlight have been in the game since IWF Attitude, but I'm grasping at straws here, guys. ECW Anarchy Rules was met with even worse review scores than its predecessor, and you guessed it, didn't sell nearly as well either. The Nintendo 64 version of the game was straight up canceled. Hardcore Revolution moved units based on the ECW logo being on the cover of a PlayStation, Nintendo, or Dreamcast box. And when fans took it home and experienced a massive disappointment, there was no way you were going to earn their trust again just six months later. Especially when they can just flip to the artwork on the back and see that it's still just a reskin of WWF Attitude. Two years later, Sculptured Software, aka Acclaim, would move on to the Legends of Wrestling series, culminating with Showdown in 2005, which you can learn all about by watching my Triangle X Squared Circle retrospective on Showdown. Link in the description. But what about ECW? What would become the baddest, bloodiest, most brutal promotion in the US? Well, there's a reason Acclaim didn't launch a new ECW game in 2002. Remember the six months between Hardcore Revolution and Anarchy Rules? Well, there were six months between the release of Anarchy Rules and ECW going out of business. The blood and guts, for the people, grassroots promotion that kickstarted its rise to prominence in 1994 was dead just seven years later. We look back on ECW as one of the all-time major players, even now, 20 years after its doors closed for the last time, and that just goes to show how special Extreme Championship Wrestling was. Look, TNA, or Impact Wrestling, is in its 19th year of operation. 19 years! But do we look back on Impact with the same hardcore love and blood-soaked affection as we do ECW? No, not even close. And even with as disappointing as these games were, and honestly still are, 
we forgive them. Click that like button right now if you're watching this video and you know, deep down, that you have positive memories of these games. I may not have owned Hardcore Revolution, but my grandma bought me Anarchy Rules for my birthday. And you bet your barb-wired ass that I played this game like it was one of the best in my collection. It's not always about polish and greatness, you know? Sometimes a less than stellar, low budget, poor production quality piece of entertainment can bring you just as much joy as the greatest of all time, based merely on how we feel about it and what it means to us. So in that way, the ECW video games are a little more similar to ECW as a whole than we may have realized. Or I'm reaching really hard because I don't want to close this on a negative note. Work with me here, guys. Dan Dans, this was my Triangle X Squared Circle retrospective on the video games of ECW. Or the history of ECW video games. I don't know, whichever one sounds better. I hope you guys enjoyed watching and I hope you played back some of those memories in your mind because that is the entire idea. Season 2 of Trying to Like Squared Circle has been a heavy hitter, as promised. We're only three episodes in and we've already covered six individual games. Can you believe that? Next time out, the main event quality isn't going anywhere as WWF WrestleMania 2000 on the Nintendo 64 is finally getting its due. Until then, I love ya, and I will see you next time. Few names are as synonymous with excellence in the wrestling video game department as Aki. If you're watching this video, you know what's up. But just in case you've taken too many chair shots to the head, remember those? I'll hit you with a quick reminder. The Aki Corporation, aka Asmic Ace Entertainment, aka The Man Breeze, aka Sin Sophia, are responsible for several of the consensus greatest wrestling games ever made. I'm not making that up. Ask around and see what types of answers you get to that question. Virtual Pro Wrestling, Aki. WCW vs. The World, Aki. WCW vs. NWO World Tour. Boom! Aki. WCW NWO Revenge. You already know. If you fast forward past the point of where I'm telling the story, you'll also get Def Jam Vendetta and its sequel, Fight for New York. You'll get Virtual Pro Wrestling 2. It's really insane the catalog that this one developer has under its belt. But back to where we were. Did you see a pattern forming there as I was going over Aki's early wrestling successes? Which name appears over and over again? WCW. The Aki Corporation, World Championship Wrestling, and THQ were a beautiful, heaven-sent trinity of everything a 90s wrestling fan could have ever asked for. With Aki behind the wheel creating the games, THQ acting as the publishing arm and making sure the games actually hit store shelves, and WCW lending their licensed logos, wrestlers, arenas, and trademark action to the mix, it was foolproof. To this day, even compared to all of the games that came out before and after it, WCW NWO Revenge is the single greatest video game representation of World Championship Wrestling to ever exist. And that's because of Aki. They got it. They understood what made WCW awesome. And they translated that into a video game that stands the test of time. Sure, it looks a little blocky by today's standards, but graphics don't mean shit. It's not about the looks, it's about the heart that's pumping the blood. And let me tell you something, there's no stronger or healthier heart in the genre than the tried and true Aki engine. I'm doing a lot of talking about WCW here, and that's because I have to. We're setting the stage for what would come to be very shortly after the release of Revenge. You see, while Aki, THQ, and WCW were releasing banger after banger, the World Wrestling Federation were releasing games as well with their longtime partner, Acclaim Entertainment. You've heard me call Acclaim by other names in previous episodes, whether it was Sculptured Software or Iguana West, it's all the same thing, it doesn't matter. What matters is this, to put it bluntly, by the time the calendar turned over to 1999, the WWF were sick and tired of not having the best game on the market. Do you think WWF in your house stood up to WCW vs. The World? No, it didn't. Did WWF Warzone hold a candle to revenge? Absolutely not. And that's the issue. So what did the World Wrestling Federation do about it? They did what they always do. They swooped in and bought the competition. 
THQ and Aki's long-term relationship with WCW was severed right then and there, as they put pen to paper with the WWF in early 1999. And yeah, I guess the correct term would be signed, not bought, but what do signings like these revolve around? Cash. So, it's not too much of a stretch. WCW would move on to a new deal with Electronic Arts and release WCW Mayhem, while the World Wrestling Federation's Nintendo 64 debut would come in the shape of WWF WrestleMania 2000. That was a meaty introduction, but hey, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to this game, and I wanted to make sure the table was completely set before we sat down for the main course. You understand? If you like these videos, consider heading over to patreon.com slash 616 entertainment, supporting the channel at any level you choose. There are all kinds of exclusives over there, like review podcasts of the Snyder Cut, Godzilla vs. Kong, the brand new Mortal Kombat movie, an entire season of Let's Play Friday. It's all good stuff, I assure you. But even if you don't, that's fine too. Now let's not waste any more time and jump right into this episode of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. The first thing any experienced wrestling gamer noticed about WrestleMania 2000 was that it was, without any exaggeration, literally WCW NWO Revenge with the WWF paint job. Now let me clarify that a little bit. On the previous episode of Triangle X Squared Circle, I buried a claim for doing this exact same thing with their ECW games. They just re-released WWF Attitude twice with ECW patches stitched into its flesh. So what makes Aki's copy and paste job of Revenge into WrestleMania any different? I mean, it should be obvious. Revenge was fantastic. Any WWF fan with half a man's ass was already wishing they could have this game with Goldberg subbed out for Austin. The NWO for DX. Nitro for Raw. This game engine being copied over, almost completely untouched, was the WWF fan's dream. I don't need to go through the ins and outs of weak and strong grapples or earning a special by filling your meter and then flicking the joystick. You know how all of this works. But WrestleMania 2000 is not only a great game based on what it does that Revenge already did. No sir. We've got several major improvements on deck that catapult this title out of copycat territory and into that of its own beast. For starters, Revenge didn't feature one gimmick match option. WrestleMania might not be kicking down the door with an endless variety of its own, but for God's sake, we must appreciate the inclusion of the steel cage match. The Black Bard steel cage, no less, which had just made one of its final appearances a few months prior to the game's release at St. Valentine's Day Massacre, in a match that saw Vince McMahon nearly cripple himself for real. I made fun of the cage in Showdown Legends of Wrestling for being absurdly tall, but WrestleMania 2000 is just as guilty in this department. Look at this thing. Who built this cage? This is the same size as that monstrosity Spider-Man was locked inside with Bonesaw. One of the biggest areas in which WrestleMania outshines its WCW predecessors is in the entrance department. Sure, coming through the Nitro stage with some badass pyro was big time, but every wrestler was given canned, generic, honestly pretty shitty sounding theme songs, rather than their signature tunes. But not here. WrestleMania 2000 finally, finally has broken the mold. Kane's ominous chorus strikes fear into the heart of his opponent. It seems like a silly thing to even consider here in 2021, but actually having the theme songs to go along with entrances was a big deal in 1999, specifically on the N64. When I was younger, I would keep the create an entrance screen from SmackDown Shut Your Mouth running on my TV while I played with my wrestling action figures. Why? So I could play the theme songs of the guys as they came walking down the aisle. Entrance themes are a big deal. And don't lie, I know you did shit like that when you were a kid. We were geniuses. The ability to edit the looks of base roster wrestlers was a staple in Aki and THQ's wrestling games all the way back from the beginning, and WrestleMania 2000 keeps that feature in tow, don't worry. If you wanted to update the colors of somebody's gear to make it more TV accurate post-release, you could do that. And side note, one of the interesting things about Nintendo 64 games was that, more often than not, your save file was tied to the cartridge itself, not your memory card, as it would be over on PlayStation. This meant that if you rented a game for the weekend from your local video store, you'd be getting the save file of the last person who had rented that copy of the game, and you'd have their adventure in your hands. 
Or, in my case, maybe you ordered a copy of WrestleMania 2000 off eBay, and the only character edits the previous owner had made was putting Austin in a robe, purposely misspelling several wrestlers' names, and changing Matt Hardy into a black man. I don't know why they did that, but they did, and it's here. And I felt the need to tell you about it. Anyway, yeah, editing wrestlers is still great, but how about creating your own wrestlers? This is another thing that, by today's standards, seems crazy. But back in 1999 when this game released, this was the first licensed wrestling game from Aki and THQ that allowed for full-on creation. And no joke, these tools are pretty sweet. I mean, we can put together a pretty awesome Randy Savage. Why not have Sting join the WWF party and rebook the whole territory? Did somebody get the Ultimate Warrior on the line? This was big business, guys. I cannot go any further without putting over this game for including one of the most important things any wrestling game can feature, at least in my opinion, as a belt mark. And there you go. That was a bit of a spoiler. I could have written that part a little cleaner. We can create our own championships and defend them in exhibition mode whenever we feel like it. I love keeping track of wins and losses, title reigns, feuds. So much of this was done in my imagination back in the day. So it was fantastic to have an in-game feature that would track championships for you. And while the wrestlers don't wear the belts to the ring or celebrate with them, they do indeed appear on the character selection screen, and they look pretty damn good, so I'm all about it. This next thing is such an innocuous little piece of the puzzle, but it's always stood out to me with WrestleMania 2000, and I wanted to draw some attention to it. Did you ever notice how warm all of the colors are in WrestleMania 2000? Look at this arena. Look at the ropes, look at the wrestlers' outfits, the crowds, the stages. Everything is so unbelievably vibrant, in my mind, it actually takes away from the game's overall appearance. Compare these visuals with those of its WCW predecessor, Revenge. Now look at WrestleMania's direct sequel, No Mercy. Neither of these games have that look and feel. Both games are toned way down in the color department to give them a much more realistic appearance. Am I insane or have any of you noticed that as well? One feature that needs no introduction is the Road to WrestleMania mode. Much like a season mode in many ways, we're taking our created superstar through an entire career's worth of ups, downs, feuds, championships, tournaments, and more. Our battles take place on weekly shows like Sunday Night Heat and Monday Night Raw, with no SmackDown in sight. And why is that? Well, maybe because SmackDown didn't even exist yet. Isn't that crazy to think about? At this point, it feels like SmackDown has been around forever. What do you mean there's no SmackDown? This mode is fairly long and adds a ton of value for the single player experience, but it's not perfect. There are difficulty spikes that will kick your ass black and blue. One of my other pet peeves in wrestling games is when you're tasked with winning every championship all at the same time. I don't want to hold every belt at once. It's nonsense. Give me a run with the Intercontinental title, let me get some mileage with it, and move higher into the world title scene. Don't make me run around with the tag belts, European belt, IC belt, hardcore belt, WWF championship, slammy trophy, money in the bank briefcase, Andre the Giant trophy, battle bull ring, PWI plaque, come on. That's madness. No wait, that's not madness. Madness is the fact that if you happen to hold several belts, which you're practically forced into doing, you're going to be in literally every match on the pay-per-view card defending all of your championships. This is beyond stupid. But let's match a negative with a positive. Each show, well, the ones that don't feature you in every match, has a fully booked card that you have the option of either watching or skipping. Keep an eye on the length of some of these matches because they are out of control. Can you imagine a 45 minute match between Matt Hardy and Mark Henry that ends in a count out? I think I'd rather ask myself than sit through that horror show. Playing deeper and deeper into Road to WrestleMania mode and accomplishing certain tasks will unlock top tier characters like Cactus Jack, Shawn Michaels, and more. But of course, useless gimmick characters like the Stooges and JR are here as well. No disrespect to the legends, but JR himself will tell you that no one has ever wanted to see him in the ring. And no, I don't want to play as him in any way. Big shout out to the Grill and JR podcast though. That's my style. A very small sect of viewers will get upset at me sometimes because I don't often cover the handheld versions of these home console games. 
Just last time out, I got a few comments asking why I didn't cover ECW Hardcore Revolution on the Game Boy Color. So to ensure that does not happen this time, let's take a look at WWF WrestleMania 2000 on the Game Boy Color. There you go. We looked at it. Do you see why I focus on the home console versions of these games? You know, the actual releases of these games? It's because nobody cares about the stripped down, cash grab mobile versions of these games. Ever. They suck. They always suck. Come on guys. You know what's the complete opposite of a shitty handheld version of WrestleMania 2000? How about using the pay per view mode to book your own card, top to bottom? Put titles on the line, host an event in Helsinki, Finland, you've got the pencil. If you've got a grand idea, this is where you can bring it to life. I love shit like this. You may notice a trend forming here in the sense that I'm not taking many shots at this game. I'm not dumping on it or tearing it apart the way I did last time with the ECW video games. And do you know why that is? It's because WrestleMania 2000 is one of the greats. We're talking about an unsung hero here, Dan Dans. Everyone gushes about WCW NWO Revenge. You'd think WWF No Mercy saved people's entire families from a burning building the way they put it over. But it's rare that WrestleMania gets any of that credit. And that's unfortunate, but it's not because it's a bad game. It's just sandwiched between two other juggernauts. I don't think I really dislike anything about WrestleMania 2000, to be honest. I mean, I wish there was some variety in the ring design. Black posts and red ropes gets boring really fast, and they all look like this. Interference happens too often, and the attackers stick around for way too long. But that's about it, and I can count off a hundred things that I love. Even if it lasts too long, I always do pop for the interference happening, because the attacker's entrance music actually hits the loudspeakers just as they break through the curtain. <laughs> I love the opening doors on the SummerSlam stage. I love that somehow, Chris Jericho made it to the WWF just in time for this game's release, making him the only playable character in both Revenge and WrestleMania 2000. I'm not counting Big Show because his name changed from The Giant. Jericho is the only name present in both games. I love that this is such a copy of Revenge that we've even got a cartoon Earl Hebner to match the cartoon Mark Curtis that we had before. Everything about WrestleMania 2000 was a WWF gamer's dream come true, and it's not often that such a statement can be made so confidently. It was on Halloween Day in 1999 that WrestleMania 2000 hit store shelves, and what a changing of the guard it was. Aki and THQ's WWF debut drew review scores higher than The Godfather at the Hall of Fame, while the once titanic WCW video games took a step back with EA's Mayhem just two months prior. This momentous shift would only intensify as time went on, and it all started with WrestleMania 2000. Dan Dans, thank you for watching my Triangle X Squared Circle retrospective on WWF WrestleMania 2000 for the Nintendo 64. I'm sorry if I didn't have the usual amount of personal stories to inject into this one, but honestly, I was a PlayStation kid growing up, I was a WCW kid, and none of my friends bought this game. Revenge was the hotness. No Mercy was the hotness. But as I mentioned before, WrestleMania 2000 was kind of the forgotten space in between, which is a shame. So let this episode act as a raising of the glass, a tip of the cap, as it were, to WrestleMania 2000. If you still have a copy, dust that some bitch off and pop it in, because I guarantee you're going to have a great time. Next time out, we are stepping away from the WWF to hop into, and I can't believe I'm saying this, The Simpsons Wrestling. You are not going to want to miss this one. But until then, I love ya, and I will see you next time. In my nearly 31 years on this planet, I've seen a million television shows come and go. Many of them were great, but short-lived. They told their story and wrapped up things before overstaying their welcome. 
Others started strong, but by the time it was all said and done, the wheels had fallen off somewhere around the halfway point. You never want to see a property you love find itself totally aimless and become self-parody. But it happens way more than many of us would like to admit. In the grand scheme though, I think there's one series that has lasted longer than anyone could have ever imagined, and that's The Simpsons. These characters, this town, these stories, are immortal. The Simpsons premiered December 17th, 1989. It has run for 32 seasons and counting, amassing more than 700 episodes. 700! They've got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, they've earned 34 Primetime Emmy Awards, there was a Simpsons movie, they've got action figures, t-shirts, everything. The cultural relevance of The Simpsons in 2021 isn't nearly to the level that it once was, and we'll talk about that later. But there was a time when The Simpsons were THE show. For some people, they even had THE video game, on several occasions. It was Castlevania and Silent Hill's parent company, Konami, who released the first video game set in our familiar town of Springfield. 1991's four-player arcade beat-em-up, simply titled The Simpsons, was a must-have in any arcade. You guys have heard me talk extensively about Mortal Kombat and its effect on the coin-operated field, but good lord, man. If The Simpsons were in town, this game was just as big a must-play as MK or Turtles in Time. Getting a few friends together and throwing down on the streets of Springfield, man, come on. And before long, the console scene would also begin overflowing with Simpsons games. From Bart vs. the Space Mutants on the NES, to Bart's Nightmare on the Genesis, so on and so forth. Many of you are thinking of maybe The Simpsons Road Rage, which, for all intents and purposes, was basically a crazy taxi clone with a new coat of paint. The most popular answer might be The Simpsons Hit and Run, which combined the open world, vehicle based, story driven ideas of Grand Theft Auto 3 with our favorite yellow cartoon family and friends. Listen, this might sound off if you've never played it, but for real, Hit and Run was a blast. I still have my original save file for this one, believe it or not. But like the individual episodes of the show itself, not every offshoot video game was great. Some were bad, some were terrible, and only one was The Simpsons Wrestling. Hello Dan Dans, my name is Ian. Welcome to another episode of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. You know, on this show we've covered some of the greatest of all time, from SmackDown vs. Raw to Def Jam Fight for New York. There's no shortage of top quality games here, but not every title you play gets that top billing. Not every disc you pop into your console of choice gets that legendary status. And let me tell you something, The Simpsons Wrestling doesn't even come close. Before we dive deep into the game itself though, I think it's important to take a look at the developer who created it. I mentioned previously that The Simpsons Hit and Run was tremendous. Hit and Run was developed by Radical Entertainment, which is the same team who gave us Incredible Hulk Ultimate Destruction, another game that's looked back on very fondly, so there's a track record. Not everything Radical put together was great, but they were capable of releasing some hits, clearly. The Simpsons Wrestling, on the other hand, was pieced together by Big Ape Productions, a company who released just five games in their entire lifespan. Outside of Simpsons Wrestling, they were also responsible for the likes of the Celebrity Deathmatch video game, which was absolutely horrendous. They were also responsible for Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, on PlayStation and PC. I rented this game one time when I was a kid, and I quickly wished I had rented something else. There's no point in delaying the inevitable any longer, I suppose. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Simpsons Wrestling. None of this is doctored to look worse than it really is. I'm not just running into opponents to paint a twisted picture of, oh, this game is bad. This is real. This is really how The Simpsons Wrestling plays, if you can even call it playing. Square is your weak attack, triangle is medium, circle is heavy. That's it. You don't modify your moves using the shoulder buttons or the D-pad or anything. There are no modifications whatsoever. You have three moves. And they're not even moves, for Christ's sake, they're strikes. As a matter of fact, there's no real wrestling to speak of. 
no suplexes, no headlocks, no- Wait, why am I still trying to analyze this like it's a run-of-the-mill wrestling title? Look at it! It's fucking horrible! Not a single one of the characters moves like any living thing I've ever seen in my life. It's this unearthly hybrid of zero-g sliding and incomplete animation starting and stopping whenever the game so desires, and it legitimately gives me a headache. Alright, alright. Let's go back to trying to critique it normally. It's hard to come up with anything in Simpsons Wrestling that actually mirrors wrestling. And no, I'm not saying it should have been a 2K style simulation. I don't need Homer and Krusty the Clown locking up and nailing beautiful headlock takeovers in their chain wrestling exchanges. But there are zero, as in not a single, wrestling move in the entire game. The bouts take place in a ring, but you can't jump off the top rope. You can bounce off the ropes, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't open up your arsenal for a new set of moves in that situation. Matches, if you can even call them that, are based on rounds, like a fighting game. Why is this called Simpsons Wrestling? Why isn't it Simpsons Boxing or Simpsons Title Fight or Springfield Contender Series or some bullshit like that? What about this has anything to do with wrestling? A winner is determined by pinfall, but... They couldn't even get this right. How in Sam hell are we counting pinfalls when the opponent is belly down? One, two, three! The very definition of a pinfall victory is to pin the shoulders, specifically the shoulder blades, to the mat. Forget calling it Simpsons Boxing or Simpsons whatever. This game should have been thrown in the fucking garbage. I'm serious. Hey, wait! Stop! I have garbage! You guys never hear me get this nasty on this show, but for the love of God, this barely, and I stress barely, is playable in any sense of the word. Wahoo! So if they can release Simpsons Wrestling with absolutely no wrestling to speak of, all bets are off, right? Can I put out Family Guy Fishing and the only way to win the game is to paint your opponent's house before they get home? How about Seinfeld Chess where you sit down at a table and you just stare at each other until one of you dies of boredom? Powerpuff Girls Tennis where you all run around the fucking court and you pick up as many little ants as you can find. No one asked for this and no one wanted it once it was delivered. It's not a scenario where it's just like, oh, I didn't even know I wanted this until I popped it into my PlayStation. Big A Productions can't lean on the fact like, oh, you know, we wanted to make good on that promise from years ago. If you want to give us something we want, how about turning Bone Storm into a real fucking video game? Shove this up your stocking! <laughs> <laughs> This entire scenario could have been avoided by just not making this game at all. What's not avoidable is talking about these graphics, the look of the game in general. The characters themselves look like they're struggling to exist. Remember that one Treehouse of Horror episode where Homer steps through the wall into the 3D world? We all thought that was awesome at the time, right? That was made in 1995, six years before Simpsons Wrestling existed. And I understand that it's not the same budget or team between the show and the game, so let's drop that comparison and instead stack Simpsons Wrestling against its peers for the time. By March of 2001, when this game launched, WWF SmackDown 2 Know Your Role had been on store shelves for six months. WWF No Mercy over on the N64 was still on fire. I can't believe I'm going here, but WCW Backstage Assault is light years ahead of Simpsons Wrestling. Yes, I said it, and I stand by it. We are in uncharted fucking territory here, but it is what it is. The audience are completely useless and largely unanimated. Honestly, watch the people around the ring. Maybe one of them will have two frames of animation. The rest are solid as a rock. The set dressing like stage curtains, bars, and nuclear silos, they're flat as a pancake. The original Mortal Kombat had dynamic backgrounds, and that was 1992, guys. 1992! This is inexcusable. What a load of crappy crap crap. Bye, boy. 
I have a feeling some bad stuff is about to go down. What boggles my mind, though, beyond anything else, is that there's a cheat you can enter the pause screen to remove the black borders around the characters. Entering this cheat actually improves the graphics. How does it not click in your mind that this looks more like the show you're attempting to translate into a video game? And why include this cheat? If you decide on an art style you're comfortable with, why include a code to switch to one you didn't like as much? What is the logic here? You know what? Pause all of this. I just question the logic of including the no borders cheat when there's also a cheat to show you when the game's development was finished. As if anyone gives a shit. Just the fucking nerve to document when they finished production, when it looks like the work had barely even started, is tone deaf beyond belief. You tried your best, and you failed miserably. The lesson is, never try. Now I'm gonna put my whole ass behind this, and I'm gonna do my best to say some nice things about Simpsons Wrestling. Because you all knew this game was bad, you all knew I was gonna tear it to shreds, you've probably seen other people tear it to shreds. It's kind of par for the course. So, let's flip the script. Let's do our best to compliment The Simpsons Wrestling. Here we go. I want to pay a compliment to the fact that across all 20 characters that are featured in the game, around half of which are playable, they all come complete with voice acting from their real life counterparts. Listen, Lisa, you better skedaddle before you get paddled. I just hate competition, <laughs> don't you? I want to compliment what they were trying to do with some of these attacks. Mo throws flaming Moes that spread fire in the ring. Ned Flanders' heavy attack, if you have time to get through the setup, calls lightning down from above. This is, without a shadow of a doubt, the best diddly-ass move in the whole game. Not that that's saying much. I also personally like the image of Moe getting his hands on Bart and causing him physical harm, because in my head, this is him finally snapping and losing his mind after all those years of prank calls. Hey, I'm looking for Amanda Hug and Kiss. <laughs> Maybe your standards are too high. Oh, I know we'd slip up sooner or later. Ah, uh, yes. Rusty and dull. The saving grace here is probably the story mode. With all of these characters, the rich lore, and jokes built over a decade plus, it'd be insane to not cash in on that, right? Well, fuck me and fuck you, there is no story mode. There's not a single cutscene in the entire game for that matter. What a joke. Oh, that's it. That's all the positivity I can muster for this one, and I want you to know that took every fiber of my being to do just that. This game sucks. There's no saving it. And I implore you, do not go scouring eBay looking for a copy of this one just to play it for shits and giggles. It's not worth your time or money. The Simpsons Wrestling holds its place in history as one of the worst video games ever made. For real, Google around and flip through a few lists. You're bound to find it. IGN's Doug Perry scored Simpsons Wrestling a 1 out of 10. A 1 out of 10! Do you have any idea how many times a 1 has been handed out in IGN's entire existence? Not many times at all, which is really saying something. In all of the games I've covered on this show, this was, by far, the worst. Nothing even comes remotely close. If I had a choice between Simpsons Wrestling being the only game I could ever play for the rest of my life and slamming my dick in the freezer door, I'd go with the freezer. Hey, hey, I'll take it. I'd rather not play video games at all than to be stuck playing this. I would rather watch a full three hour Raw than play Simpsons Wrestling. And I can't believe there's anything in this world that could get me to sit through that dog shit. Luckily, I didn't own Simpsons Wrestling as a kid. I rented it once from the local Hollywood video, and within minutes I'd started to question every decision I'd ever made. What was going through my stupid little shithead brain that made me believe, for even a second, that this might have panned out as anything other than what it is? I don't know. But I'm not gonna lose any more sleep over it. Would you excuse me for a moment? Simpsons Wrestling fucking sucks. I hate it, and I don't want it in my house anymore. For real. I'm gonna give this shit away on Twitter or something. I want it out. The popular opinion out there is that the quality of The Simpsons television show hit a steep decline in either the late 90s or the early 2000s. And wouldn't you know it, Simpsons Wrestling released very early into 2001. 
It's a certifiable fact that The Simpsons Wrestling is what tanked The Simpsons Empire. The show itself suffered because of the release of this game. It's, it's a fact. It's definitely true. You can prove it. Uh, thank you for joining me for this installment of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. You know, The Simpsons Wrestling is the worst game I have ever played on this channel, and I really hope it stays that way. I don't want to play anything else like this. But next time out, that all changes. On the Season 2 finale of Triangle X Squared Circle, we're going to be taking a look at Saturday Night Slam Masters on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Until then, I love you, and I will see you next time. Professional wrestling today is a far cry from what it was just a short time ago in many respects. For instance, the wrestling of today looks like this. It's insanity. It's largely, how can I put this nicely, not what it used to be. Moves that once upon a time signified the end of a match are now as common as a rear chin lock, and they get the job done about as often as that rear chin lock does. Now you can feel one of two ways about this. You can celebrate the, and I'm using air quotes, evolution of the show with its lack of impact and selling of big moves, or you can hate it. You can watch a few minutes of Monday Night Raw or AEW Dynamite and go, you know what, I think that's all for me. I'm not going to tell you how to feel. You do whatever you want. I'm just setting the scene for where we're going, establishing the context for the story I'm about to tell. You see, in 1993, the wrestlers who were on top of the world weren't hitting front flip pile drivers on the ring apron and 27 sweet chin musics per match for a two count. The top wrestlers in 1993 were guys like Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, Sting, and Vader. And if any of these main eventers caught you with their finishing move even once, it was over. It's supposed to be called a finishing move for a reason, right? We didn't have any of this stuff in the ring back in 1993. Not even in the video game realm. For real, go back and check. WCW wrestling on the NES was as cut and dry as it gets. It's old school, 8-bit, pro wrestling. WWF Royal Rumble on the 16-bit platforms was largely the same. It was reminiscent of the television product. You wear an opponent down, spike them with your finisher, and it's lights out. These games were being developed by teams watching the shows and going, Man, I bet we can do that. We can recreate that classic WWF look and feel on the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. I know we can. And for the most part, they did. We all have nostalgia for these older games, right? But not every game studio out there was willing to settle for the real world limitations of early 90s pro wrestling. Others dreamed bigger. They envisioned something greater. Insert Saturday Night Slam Masters. This is pro wrestling meets Street Fighter with high flying, acrobatic, brain busting maneuvers in a game that sends you around the world, battling it out in the ring on your quest to win the world championship. Back in 1993, you had never seen anything like this before. What's up, Dan Dans? My name is Ian. Welcome to another installment of Triangle X Squared Circle, the wrestling game retrospective series. This is the Season 2 finale, and I think we're sending Season 2 out in style, don't you? Saturday Night Slam Masters is a lesser known title, that's for certain. But it's one of those games where if you know, you know. This one was released all over the place, from arcades, to the Super Nintendo, to the Sega Genesis, and several other places in between. There are distinct differences between each version, and we're going to dive into all of that. Now let's get to it. One of the first things anyone notices about Saturday Night Slam Masters is its unique art style. It definitely doesn't look like WCW Super Brawl Wrestling or WWF Royal Rumble, that's for sure. I'll let you decide which one looks best. Just check out the poster for this one. God damn is that gorgeous. Now if you're looking at this poster and thinking, man, that style looks pretty familiar. I've seen it before. Well, you're probably a fan of Fist of the North Star. Tetsuo Hara, the artist and co-author of the famous anime series, was lead artist and designer here on Saturday Night Slam Masters. That is pretty awesome. 
It reminds me of Akira Toriyama's art in Dragon Quest. It's decidedly his style. It's got that Toriyama flair that you've seen a million times in Dragon Ball and other properties, and you can see it all over Dragon Quest the second you lay eyes on it. There's just something about that. It feels good. Saturday Night Slam Masters may have fallen under the radar of many gamers and even wrestling fans, but that's not because it sucks. As a matter of fact, and this is just my personal opinion, Slam Masters is better than anything WCW or the WWF were offering at the time. And how can I say that? Well, I'm not just going to say it. You can take a look at all of them and tell me what you think in the comments below. Remember the badass entrances of WWF Royal Rumble and WCW Super Brawl Wrestling? No, you don't. Guys like the Ultimate Warrior had been sprinting down the ramp for ages, shaking the ropes. Vader was coming out with his big-ass helmet that would shoot steam. Ric Flair had his shiny robes glimmering in the bright lights. And none of it was represented in WCW's or WWF's video games. At all. But Saturday Night Slam Masters? Shit. Why does Capcom understand the pageantry and theatrics of professional wrestling better than the developers working on the actual, licensed, big league wrestling promotions games? Look at this, man! The pyro, the lasers, the fog, an actual entrance ramp. This is it. Slam Master's presentation was second to none, Dan Dans. Did I mention everyone has their own theme music? And it doesn't just stop before the bell rings, no way. Look at the crowd. Check out the kid with his gigantic foam finger having a blast, rooting on his favorite wrestler. Get a load of the cameraman at ringside. We've got a photographer catching stills for what must have been a badass sports magazine. And we've got a big boy TV camera as well, which turns to face the action depending on where the athletes are located in the ring. The flash bulbs in the audience are popping off left and right. Man, I wish I could get a look at some of those photos. The crowd also changes colors with each new arena you visit, giving all of the environments their own unique feel. Not just the crowd, either, but the playable characters themselves have a multitude of differently colored outfits, just like Sting or Ric Flair would on television. By the way, all of these details I just listed off, all of these things that add to the experience and really make it feel alive, can't be found in Royal Rumble or Super Brawl. And I don't mean to constantly compare them, I'm just saying what needs to be said. Slam Masters was ahead of its time. It was ahead of the competition, and it set the tone for what wrestling games needed to start looking like in order to truly capture the vibe of a live show. Let me also give a shout out to the Slam Masters referee, who was decidedly smaller than all of the wrestlers, giving them a much more exaggerated, larger than life presence. It's like how the WWF used to hire tiny backstage interviewers to stand next to Andre the Giant. He was already enormous, but having Mean Gene, who was the average man's height of 5'9", standing next to him, it amplified Andre's gargantuan stature even more. Can you imagine having a referee who was 6'4", or a backstage interviewer walking around at 6'3"? The illusion wouldn't be nearly as powerful. It's the little things, man, and Capcom totally understood that here with Slam Masters. At this point, you're going, we get it, it looks good. There's a level of attention to detail here that blows away the competition. That's fantastic. How does it feel to play? How does it feel when I get the controller in my hands? Relax, relax. I got you. I've always likened the gameplay of Saturday Night Slam Masters to Street Fighter meets Pro Wrestling. And it's not just the pixel art style that the comparison comes from, but the controls themselves. This is one of very few wrestling games with a goddamn jump button, but it just... works. It's awesome. Wrestling is already insane and over the top. Why not have these guys jumping 12 feet in the air, right? For another example of a jump button in a wrestling game, watch last month's episode of Triangle X Squared Circle on Simpsons Wrestling. Would you rather play this game or just stand on train tracks and wait? That's up to you. Each character has several strikes. Some are good for up-close attacks, others keep your opponent at range. In this sense, again, it feels like a straight-up fighting game. And not a bad one. I always thought that Gunlock's super fast punches were pulled straight from E Honda's playbook. Grappling is pulled off when you close distance and pull your opponent in. Using different combinations with the D pad and the attack button will result in unique suplexes, slams, power bombs, pile drivers, and other high impact maneuvers. On top of basic strikes and grapple moves, though, you're out of your ass if you don't think every competitor has their own selection of super slams. 
which are much more complicated to pull off. We're talking about full-on Mortal Kombat 2 fatality inputs for some of these things. I don't know how in Sam Hell anyone ever figured some of these out if they didn't have the manual at home. These sons of bitch are complicated. But once you've got it memorized, you're made. Because they look great, and goodness me do they inflict a ton of damage. The roster itself is kind of a funny story. We've got colorful characters galore, from the ultra macho ladies man El Stingray, to Rasta, the 6'6", six 300 six, plus pounder who comes to the ring with his little monkey friend, so on and so forth. The funny story part comes into play in myriad ways. First of all, we've got Final Fight's Mike Hagar in the mix, which is fucking awesome. If you think I'm ever gonna turn down the opportunity to pound punks with the spinning pile driver, you got another thing coming. But check this out. The game itself seemingly has no idea when any of this is taking place, what universe it's taking place in, or even who the hell any of these people actually are. That sounds confusing, but hear me out. The Japanese version of Slam Master seems to insinuate that this is a prequel to... something. At least in Hagar's case, as it states that this is before Hagar ever held office. That's fine, right? Who cares? Well, the English version cares, as it labels Hagar as the former mayor of Metro City. So which one is it? This sort of confusion doesn't stop here though. This guy is named Lucky Colt in the Japanese version. He is trained under Hagar and yada yada. Cut to the English release where his name is Gunlock. His bio claims that he might possibly, you know, kinda sorta be related to somebody from Street Fighter. What? Players kind of assume that he was related to Guile as they have similar appearances and some of their moves kinda line up, but it was never confirmed. Let's sidebar to Street Fighter, the movie, the game. I promise there's a point to this. If you choose Blade, this weird asshole, and beat the game, you're treated to his ending, where it's revealed that his name isn't Blade, his name is fucking Gunlock, and he is indeed Guile's brother. This is ridiculous. Is Street Fighter, the movie, the game actually canon? I don't think so. So it's all unofficial, right? Well, Street Fighter V Special Edition did come with an art book that details Blade's history in the franchise, so... What the fuck? I guess it is canon, right? Good lord. The whole roster is like this, too. Everyone has a different name between the different releases, their backstories are all changed, it's a mess. But honestly, who gives a shit? The game is fun and you're gonna forget about the character backgrounds anyway, right? My advice is this. Don't even concern yourself with any other backstories. Just have fun. The roster wasn't the only thing to change between releases though. From the arcade to Super Nintendo to Sega Genesis and everywhere else this game was ported, there were several considerable differences between the releases. Hello? Can you tell me about the differences between the versions? Yeah, I was just about to. That's what I'm setting up right now. Yes. Yes. Wait, how did you even know I was recording this? Who is this? <laughs> what the fuck was that? To put it bluntly, I mean, the arcade version looks the best, obviously. Just like Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter or any of those other arcade releases, the cabinet is the big boy. That's the big business. But that's not the only place where we notice a specific change. I mentioned earlier that Rasta gets pissed when people mess with his little monkey. On console, the monkey disappears after Rasta's entrance. But in the arcade, he hangs out on the top rope during Rasta's match, cheering him on. I love this. I wish I had a little monkey buddy. Patches Lugosi. You want a little monkey friend? Okay. The two characters Scorpion and Jumbo are not playable in the Super Nintendo version of the game for some reason, but they're on the roster from the very start over on Sega Genesis. Scorpion has one of my favorite movesets in the game, so it's nice that he's playable somewhere. But where the SNES lacks these two characters, they make up for it with a referee. That doesn't seem like a fair trade, and maybe it's not. I think I'd rather have the two extra playable characters, but the referee is awesome. I love his pinfall animation. 
I like seeing him try to stay the hell out of the way of the action. The Super Nintendo, in my opinion, also just generally sounds better. That's all a matter of opinion though, obviously. What's not a matter of opinion though, is that the Sega Genesis version features a barbed wire landmine exploding ring fucking deathmatch. Hell yeah. This is so fucking cool, I can't help but gush about it. Whip a guy into the ropes and they explode. Force him to touch the landmines outside the ring and it's big time boomtown. Come on, dude. Plus, the fans throw weapons into the ring. We've got buckets and bats and a goddamn table? Are you serious? Break it over the other guy's head and watch it splinter. Guys, Saturday Night Slam Masters is so awesome. As far as the critical reception was concerned, not everybody spoke as glowingly about this title as I am currently. I mean, Game Informer hit Slam Masters with a 7 out of 10, which is good. Very respectable for a first try and a brand new IP, let alone a wrestling game with no license attached to it at a time that WCW and the WWF were releasing games of their own. A 7 is perfectly fair, in my opinion. Now I'm not gonna name names here, but the jerk-off who reviewed Slam Masters for Next Generation Magazine stated that the deathmatch mode on the Sega Genesis version was literally the only thing saving the game from being horrible and recommended that gamers purchase WWF Raw instead. Yeah. I wonder why that magazine hasn't published an issue in 20 years and uh, went out of business. What a jabroni. I'm sorry, that was mean, but I feel very strongly about Saturday Night Slam Masters. How you doing? I, like most of you watching, I would assume, didn't grow up with Slam Masters, unfortunately. I had a fun selection of games, but I had never even heard of this one until I was a teenager. Nobody at school ever talked about it, none of my friends ever brought it up, none of my friends owned it, none of them ever even mentioned this game. But like I stated at the top, just because it's lesser known, doesn't mean that it's bad. Saturday Night Slam Masters, in my mind, is the epitome of a hidden gem. It looks great, it plays great, it was ahead of its time, and it holds up. If you're a retro gamer or just someone who still has a Super Nintendo or a Genesis in your house and you're curious, pop on over to eBay. You can pick up a copy of Slam Masters for between 20 and 40 bucks fairly regularly and you won't regret adding this one to your collection. Even if you didn't grow up with this one, it's never too late to create memories. And with some friends over or even on your own, that's definitely gonna happen when Saturday Night Slam Masters is the main event of the evening. There it is, Dan Dans. Thank you for joining me for the Season 2 finale of Triangle X Squared Circle, the Wrestling Game Retrospective Series. Across these six episodes, we have covered nine individual titles from the early 90s all the way through into the mid-2000s. There are still so many titles on the docket, from WWF No Mercy, to Rumble Roses, to Backyard Wrestling 2, to the Day of Reckoning series, to that weird fucking AAA game. I think Chikara's got a game coming out. We've got Fire Pro titles on consoles. All There's a lot more to come. Trying to like squared circle is going on the shelf so I can focus on the history of Halloween, but I assure you, when Season 3 rolls around, the best is yet to come. Thank you for the continued support specifically regarding this series, and thank you for the continued support over on Patreon.com slash 616Entertainment. We recently passed the third goal, unlocking a brand new show, which I will announce for the first time right here. It's called Sting Money, a wrestling retrospective podcast. Have you ever heard that term Sting Money before? It comes from when Scott Hall was jumping from the WWF over to WCW. He said he wasn't interested in hopping over for anything less than Sting Money. So what we're going to do on this show is watch a classic wrestling pay-per-view. We're going to determine who was the MVP on the show, what was the best match of the show, would we pay Sting Money to watch this show, and if not, what kind of money would we have paid for it? I think it's going to be a good time. Listen to it first over on Patreon.com slash 616Entertainment. I love you very much, and until next time... I will see you soon.